2018 has been a great year for Nginx Plus. We heard a lot yesterday from Sydney about the details and the features that were released in R15 and R16. R16 shipped just last month and has been one of the biggest releases ever since we took the open source code base and enhanced it by adding enterprise grade capabilities. Now, I wish I had enough time to talk about all of the enhancements that we put into Nginx plus R16, but we've got so much to share with you this morning. I'm just going to focus on one topic, and that's clustering. The conversations that we've been having with, with you, our customers, over the past 12 to 18 months has shown us a clear shift in the way that Nginx is being deployed. The rapid adoption of containerized environments, orchestration platforms, elastic cloud environments has provided us a, a shift from the archetypal active-passive pair to a scaled-out cluster of three or five or ten Nginx Plus instances, all working in parallel, sharing the same traffic. So here's your typical, typical cloud-based application delivery environment, an edge load balancer, just doing layer 4 TCP packet spraying, to a cluster of Nginx Plus instances doing TLS termination, reverse proxy, layer 7 routing, the usual good stuff. And of course, a distributed, scaled out back end application. <clears throat> but distributing workloads brings its own set of challenges, and the first of these is load balancing. When, like this, you have multiple load balancers, Distributing traffic to the same set of backends, how does each one make the best decision about where to send that traffic? Surprisingly, the answer is not to try and make the best decision at all. By the way, as Owen said, it's great to be in Atlanta. It's my first time in the city, and I'm really enjoying my time here. And I'd like to tell you that you know, this is the vision that I'll remember of my arrival into Atlanta. But the reality of the situation is this is what I'll remember. Now, you're not allowed to take photographs in the immigration halls, but I was really sneaky, like down here. Anyway, we've all been in the, through you know, these kind of lines, and uh, you know, as I got towards the front here, I noticed that of the 10 or so passport desks with immigration officers sitting there, there were three airport staff uh, waiting to bring us into the little lines. And I thought, oh, that's nice, because you know, you're standing at the end of the line, you've got 10 decks, you're trying to keep an eye on everything, and you, know, you can miss you know, that the one guy became free, and some gives you a tap on the shoulder, and everyone's grumpy. So three airport staff, and they're sending us across into little rows of four or five behind each desk, in front of each desk, I should say. I thought, ah, I recognize this architecture. These are load balancers. And so I was pretty pleased with that. I thought, oh, this is nice. I'll, I'll make a mental note here. But we had three load balancers distributing traffic to about 10 passport desks. And I quickly realized that this was an absolutely terrible system. And I got really frustrated with the internal screaming when I realized that this system was based on the premise that each passport officer would process a single traveler in the same amount of time. And I'm sure you'll agree that international travelers do not exhibit a consistent workload. <laughs> so we had, like myself, frequent flyer on a visa waiver program, and you know, these guys come with the passport ready, boom, it's on the desk, you're processed, you're out of there less than a minute. We also had non-English speakers. They get to the desk, at which point the passport officer realizes he doesn't speak English, presses a button, calls for a translator, translator wanders over one, two minutes later, then there's a protracted three-way conversation about what's the purpose of your visit, and eventually everything's good and they go through, but that takes up to five minutes. And then my particular joy was that I had, there was a family of four or five people, and uh, the families go up together, right? So the queue of four people disappeared. Queue was empty. Airport staff goes, great, empty queue, five people straight over here. I was at the back of that queue, and I wasn't in a queue of four or five, I was in a queue of nine, where the passport officer is now juggling two tired children, two non-English-speaking non adults, four passports, 
And I was sitting there for about 15 minutes, and the line was empty behind me. So, this is a, these are the problems that you get when you try and distribute traffic, and you low, have independent load balancers making independent decisions. It's not the smartest way. So we were trying to do join shortest queue. That's the algorithm, known as least con in Nginx circles. With Nginx class R16, we introduced a new load balancing algorithm. It takes a different approach, and it's designed for clustered environments such as this. So instead of trying to solve a problem like this, when a request comes in, it's picked up by one of the Nginx plus instances, it now has to make a decision with an imperfect view. Right? So instead of trying to do it this way, we do it this way. We know we have an imperfect view. We know that there are other load balancers who also have an imperfect view, because we're all handling in-flight traffic, and we're sending data to these backends. And we don't know how long each one is going to take. And so it turns out, you look at those backends, you pick two at random. Doesn't matter which two, two random choices. And then whichever has the shortest queue, that's your winner. And the benefit of this is that you don't send traffic to what you know has more connections than the other guy. Right? It's not the best choice, but it's deliberately not the worst choice. And when everyone is doing, following this model and picking the best option out of two random choices, we get a very nice, smooth distribution, especially for uh, variable workloads. But load balancing isn't the only challenge you face when deploying a clustered set of load balancers. Right. New releases in 2018, we, reduced, we introduced synchronization of runtime state for several features, sticky sessions, rate limiting, and our in-memory key value store. With all of these features, with an Nginx Plus cluster, they now know what else is going on across the cluster. And we can combine these features to create enhanced use cases, to create an elastic ingress tier that can adapt to the traffic levels and provide dynamic protection from bad actors. With runtime state sharing, each Nginx Plus instance can exchange information about what it is currently experiencing. For example, the current request rate for each client IP address making connections. It's deployed in a full mesh topology, so it's peer-to-peer, -peer, so that each Nginx Plus instance shares information with every other node in the cluster. And as I said, we can use this information to help have the cluster protect itself from bad actors. Bad bots now account for 21% of all internet traffic. And this is traffic that you can remove from your website. How do we do this? Let's uh, switch to the demo, and we'll see how to neutralize bad actors. So I've got a blog. This is a turnkey, off-the-shelf, $5 a month, DigitalOcean cloud image running the world's most popular de facto web application, WordPress. You may have seen something like it before. Here, let's just make sure we're still running. Good, good. It's out of the box, one little blog post. And at the same time, I've currently got 737 bad actors hammering away at it. Now, I've configured my Nginx Plus cluster. I've got three of them. I've got that top edge load balancer spraying traffic across everything. So what's going on here? I know that a good actor, a human browsing my blog, is going to make a request to the home page, maybe click on a blog entry and have a read of it. And the home page, it's got 10 resources, a bunch of JavaScript, a bunch of images. It's about 250 kilobytes. And a web browser will consume that, making 10, maybe 20 requests a second. You look around, you click something else. I know that if I've got a bad actor, if I've got a bot, it's going to be just be hammering it and hammering it and hammering it, and either it's scraping data and moving around the site, but it doesn't wait. It just goes crazy. And so if I see a rate limit exceeding 25, 50 requests a second, First of all, I'm sharing that rate limit information across the cluster. So it doesn't matter if they're hitting different Nginx Plus instances. If they exceed the rate limit, 
what I don't do is just reject them. Right? A rejected bot says, ah, I've been done, yeah, rumbled. I'll go spin up a new IP address, and I'll do something else. So what we do is we send a successful response, 200. Yeah, get the data. But at the same time, I'm going to clock your IP address, and I'm going to put it in the key value store, and I'm going to call it that sin bin. So when you go in the sin bin, the next time you come back, I'm going to give you a bandwidth limit. 10 kilobytes per second, something like that, something really low. And I'm just going to neutralize you. Right? We take the bad actors. We're going to turn the slow HTTP attack on its head, and we're going to send a really slow response. Nginx doesn't care. It can handle tens, hundreds of thousands of concurrent connections. But if we slow them down, they're not able to uh, loop around again and hit us with that high request rate. So what's happening right now, we're nearly up to our full thousands uh, bad actors. I've got about 40 regular users. They click the home page. They have a look. They click a blog post. Let me just scroll down here. And we can see that the, the home page for these bad actors is, you know, we've, as we've ramped up, we're now sending that back in around about 10 seconds average. If you clicked on the, uh, the blog post entry, as my good actor is doing, I'm, that green line is fixed down at you know, one second response time. Nobody who is a real human is experiencing any slowdowns. And if I look at my individual instances here, I've got three, my three Nginx nodes. This why it's counting 696. We're still climbing, because as we're slowing down the bots, we're slowing down the rate at which they are able to exceed the rate limit. So we're also giving our servers an easier time. And this total count of the number of bad actors is synchronized. And as I flip through the rest, you'll see that it's now starting to fall because I've put a 10-minute timeout in my sin bin. All right, sin bin is a temporary thing. You go in there for 10 minutes, you come out again. And this means that I don't need to change any configuration. This is a static config. It's identical across the three instances. And as bad actors come and go, we put them in the sin bin, we neutralize them, and we take them out. And so we start to fall. And the whole while, the blog is still running along nicely, Wi-Fi permitting. Terrific. Go back to the slides. Now imagine we've got this configuration in a multi-cloud environment where each Nginx Plus instance is sharing traffic and runtime state with all of the others. So if a bad actor rocks up and hits our AWS instance, that rate limit and the sin bin value that results will get replicated, and your on-prem data center is protected before that bot starts crawling around your other parts of the infrastructure. One example of some of the great use cases that you can use to combine the new Nginx Plus features with R16 and stop bad things happening to your data centers. With that, I'm back to Owen. Thank you.